Hey everyone, welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I am excited for today's episode because it's over a year in the making. Um, <laughs> over a year ago, I don't know, maybe two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I don't really remember, uh, Catholic University of America Press put out the first volume of the uh, collected, uh, critical edition of the collected works of Carol Wojtyla slash John Paul II. Um, and uh, that, that first volume, titled Person and Act and Related Essays, uh, is his kind of philosophical magnum opus. And it took me a little over a year to, to read this thing. Definitely one of the top three most difficult books I've ever read. I'd say the other two were a book by Gargou Lagrange and Aristotle's Metaphysics. I'm really happy today to be talking to my friend Timothy Flanders. He had me on his uh, podcast and YouTube channel, The Meaning of Catholic, last year to talk about uh, not the main work, Person and Act, but some of the pl preliminary essays that are included in the book that uh, pre- seated the 1969 publication of Wojtyla's Person and Act. And uh, we're just going to try to discuss this and get across some of the points we thought were important as best we can. Timothy, welcome back to the show. Oh, wh what a joy. What a pleasure to talk with you again, my brother. Um, yeah, I, I just checked the date. It was 2021. And I think it was in the summer when it actually came out, or maybe the fall. Okay. So I think it, so. Maybe a, a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, definitely. I I I literally just finished this last week, and I, I think it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably the the hardest book I've ever read. The mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. Probably. I can't think of another book that compares. To yeah, I think on the whole. I think on the whole too, because uh, Aristotle's Metaphysics like varied in difficulty throughout this is just pretty difficult in general yes. but i get the impression that you have a, a little more grounding in the cultural and philosophical context of john paul ii of Voiti was uh intellectual work perhaps than i do um he's associated with two schools of philosophy uh by many people phenomenology and personalism and obviously those things need to be qualified. There's different, there's different schools within those. Um, and, uh, there's different possible approaches to them, but, um, I, I'm going to have to rely on you a little bit here, if you don't mind, uh, to, to, to talk a little bit about, um, the philosophical context that he's working in. Yeah. Well, I think that the very first thing there's, I mean, St. John Paul II is such a critical and popular figure who has touched the lives of literally millions of people, millions of souls. And at the same time, I think there are many things that are misunderstood about him. And one of the things is a very, very, very common misconception is that John Paul II was a phenomenologist. And hmm. that's true, but also false. Um, right. His first, he had two doctorates. The, his first doctorate was other was uh, in Thomism. It was under the greatest Thomist of the era, Father Reginald Garrigou Grange, uh, in Rome. Yeah. He did his dissertation on the idea of faith in Saint John of the Cross, and mm -hmm. um, so he's he is trained in the best Thomism of the 20th century, without a doubt. So he is trained as a Thomist. Uh, thinking like a Thomist, but he is also like St. Thomas. He is not merely repeating what came before, but he's actually applying what came before into a new synthesis, which is exactly what St. Thomas did, which is what um, Francisco Suarez did to create Suarism. Um, and so what's interesting about him is he's definitely a Thomist. First of all, he's a Thomist. He is definitely a Thomist. But like St. Thomas, he takes on the philosophical problems that are going on in modern philosophy. Yeah. And he gets his second doctorate in a man called Max Scheler. Who is Max Scheler? Max Scheler is a German philosopher in the tradition of what I would call Augustinian phenomenology. And the reason I say that is because the term phenomenology is another phenomenon, another term that's very misunderstood. 
because it's a it's a philosophical school of thought which is founded by Edmund Husserl, who is a baptized Jew who was he was trained with Aristotle under um, Franz Brentano, who's a Catholic priest, and then um, his, his fellow student was Sigmund Freud. Fun fact. <laughs> but what happens wow. was Edmund Husserl founds that his first philosophical efforts are. A, a, a basically a, a what it is is a platonic method a platonic methodology of classical realism and that we, we need a little bit more breaking down of what that is <laughs> essentially it's not an Aristotelian methodology it's a platonic methodology but it is a realistic methodology realism is the the idea that there is absolute truth basically uh there's subjectivism um the um you know the dictatorship of relativism that um the dictatorship of relativism that pope benedict talked about you know there is no absolute truth your truth is as good as mine whatever realism is the only philo philosophy that the church can stomach everything else she she vomits out every other form of philosophy but phenomenology in its original founding by edmund husserl uh is realistic but it is a different, mm. it is a different methodology, and we could talk more about what that is. But it's different than Aristotle. That's the key. Um, Max Scheler is a disciple of Edmund Husserl. Uh, there's two other famous disciples of Edmund Husserl, namely Dietrich von Hildebrand and Edith Stein, aka Saint Teresa Benedicta a Cruce. Um, mm. But Max Scheler is 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 kind of the black sheep of those three because he. Whereas the, those first two I just mentioned were pious Catholics who died pious Catholics, and one of them is a saint. Max Scheler was not so pious. He was a Catholic, but he actually died excommunicated because he was he divorced his wife and married again and a bunch of stuff. Uh -huh. But before he sort of fell into all this sin, he did write a number of uh, very profound works that had a huge impact on 20th century, 20th century philosophy. And so... All of that to say, finally getting back to the point, is that Carol Wojtyla does his second doctorate on the question, can we use Max Scheler to formulate a system, an ethical system? That's his question for his doctorate is, can we use Max Scheler's thought, his, his phenomenological system to create an ethical system? And his answer was no. That was his answer was that no, you cannot. And the fun fact is that Dietrich von Hildebrand said, yes, you can. And he wrote a book called ethics on that very thing. But um, so right there, we can already see that Dietrich von Hildebrand is really a phenomenologist, whereas John Paul II rejects Max Scheler's phenomenological system as a base of ethics. Nevertheless, he does say that one can use this to basically what he's trying to do here is he's trying to fill in certain gaps in Thomism that had not been totally worked out in the Thomistic tradition, namely the reality of the subjective the reality of the consciousness and the reason i mm. use that phrase is to again distinguish this from subjectivism and relativism because we all know that we have a conscience subjective experience because it's real we all experience it we all know it's real and this is just this is just a philosophical metaphysical epistemological area it's saint thomas and Tom thomism had not fully explored. They had to explore it to a degree, but St. Uh, John Paul II is just going to the depths here, basically, with this text. Um, and ultimately, yeah. it founds, really, it results in a, synth a synthesis, a synthesizing philosophical school called personalism. So all that to say is... If I can just... Yeah, go ahead. If I can just mention um, the second volume of the collected works of Wojtyla, uh, from Catholic University of America Press is going to include his writings on Max Scheler. I just thought it'd be yes. good time to point. Oh that yes, out. so that uh, coming soon. I think you'd buy it now, but uh, I think yeah. yeah, you can order it now. Yeah. So all that to say is it, it's 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 a misconception and it's also misleading to state that Saint John Paul II was a phenomenologist. Part of that is because the original English translation of this work was very faulty and very messed up because it was. It was unfortunately um, the uh, Tamienska, the, the original translator is now deceased, rest in peace. But she actually kind of decided to translate it. And, and sh what she did was she translated it in English and then she took out all the Latin references to St. Thomas and all these Latin terms and Thomistic terms out of this text. Right. 
And right. that's what may, gave the appearance that he's just a phenomenologist. He's not even trying to work within Thomism. But with the new translation that's that right. CUI Press just came out, translated by Jagosh Ignatik, um, he they restored the 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 crucial texts, the crucial aspects of it. That's really this is in the Thomistic tra tradition, really. Uh, since since Satani Pachis, there's been all these different yeah. forms of Thomism. There's this like transition transcendental Thomism, uh, the Neo Thomism of the Roman school. All these different forms of applying Thomism to different sort of aspects and forms of modern questions. And this is just another form of that, essentially. But it becomes known as Christian personalism. So you could call it he's a yeah. Christian personalist or he's a phenomenological Thomist, for example, something like that. But phenomenologist is probably the weaker of the identifiers, I think, when you talk about John Paul II's thought. Right. Yeah. And I might add, um, interestingly, that I think that the podcast that we've done about this volume, this new translation, I think it's like pretty much the only commentary <laughs> that has appeared yet uh, since this new translation came out, like I don't think there's been a single academic review of it yet. For instance, oh, really? which, wow. and uh, yeah, and one uh, and one level uh, is surprising, but I can understand it actually because it seems as though um, I'm not an academic. It, it does seem as though the timeline for digesting and reviewing academic works is slower than say you know the popular publishing right. <laughs> world, and and also this in particular, you could imagine that it would take people a while to really I'm sure plenty more people have bought it, you know, than than have read it, finished re right. <laughs> reading it yet, even among academics, you know. So um uh I don't think it's that people are ignoring it, but that it just uh I think it's just gonna take a while for this to to sort of sink in and be digested. Uh so so it just uh the two of us, um non professionals. Now, do you have a degree in philosophy? I can't remember. No, my, well, my degree in... is in classical languages. I did take some philosophy, but yeah, I'm not I'm not gotcha. a very good philosopher, but I understand. Okay, so that. neither of us are professional <laughs> yeah. philosophers. So we're just doing the best we can here, yes. listeners, and apologies if we, you know, if we get anything wrong. But I think that I think we can at least we're not going to do like a total overview of the whole book in a systematic way, but I think we'll we'll cover some some important points and try to get across the general gist for for the lay person um so um you you also mentioned uh before we started recording um it was important to talk about like the the polish context culturally um for this work and um now obviously the personalism aspect relates uh well but both of it i mean his his sort of epistemology his his discussion of consciousness and the human person um he, they they relate to the political situation as well and the various ideologies that are forming not only in the sort of world of academic philosophy but obviously what marx has to say about the human person it's interesting in person and act uh he makes a point i think in one of the um subsequent essays or addresses that are collected in this volume that the, he didn't write it in a scholarly sky, style it's relatively no, light on footnotes um he didn't he didn't really have the time he had many duties you know he didn't have the time to just sort of like ma make this like a thoroughly scholarly treatment but it's offering his reflections and so he's not all the time referencing other other thinkers he does reference some other thinkers like um uh, one most frequently cited in the footnotes is Roman Ingarden, who I don't know anything about. But um, one of the few sort of ideological currents that he that he mentions repeatedly is Marxism. He does contrast his views with Marxism a few times. I think also uh, mentions Kant on a number of uh, places in the book. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, how, how do you think that this this sort of ties in with his more concrete efforts against Marxism, um, you know, later on as a pope or even at the time as as a bishop? Yeah, it, so Poland is a very unique culture because Poles call uh, Poles Poles really call themselves Central Europe, uh, which I think is accurate. Anglo's don't say that, and I think that's wrong. Um, and the reason it's called Central Europe is because they're a Slavic people with the Latin right. And so mm -hmm. they are a synthesizing center of all of East-West Christendom. 
So they mm. speak the language of the East, uh, but they worship in the Latin rite. So they're connected with the West and connected to the East. So they're East towards Russia and towards the Greeks and all of the Eastern tradition of Christendom, but also to the Western Christendom. And to the West, obviously, is Germany. The, the border of Poland is Germany. Yeah. Um, but I think also the kinship between Poland and France culturally, you know, in, in modern times as well. Yeah. There, so there's all, there's very, so Poland is just looking to the West and looking to the East. But what's fascinating about Poland is that there's only two countries that survived the pot Protestant revolt that were outside the bounds of the traditional Roman empire. Only two countries who did that. And one is Ireland mm. and the other one is Poland. And wow. Christopher Dawson says that the reason is because the ethnicity, the ethnic identity of these peoples had so melded with Catholicism as that had as it had done in the Roman Empire areas like Italy and Spain, right. who kept the faith um, that it, even in a Protestant dominated world and, and in, in Poland, there's there are like Protestants in the, to the West and to the North and Eastern Orthodox to the East their ethnicity is so dominated and, and imbued with Catholicism that they survived this storm. So the re why is this important? The reason is because in the, in the modern period, well, first of all, I should, I should back up a little bit. Poland has a very unique structure. It's even more unique than Ireland in this way is because it had a very traditional parliamentary system of government and thought and subsidiarity, um, which was able to incorporate and tolerate both Protestants and Jews within their society without losing their Catholic identity. Hmm. Um, and then after these various powers in the East and West take over Poland at the end of the 18th century, the, the so-called partition of Poland, so they lose their sovereignty, so that the nation of the Poles lose their own they're basically under foreign denomination domination since the late 18th century after that we have this strong ethnic identity which is identified so closely with freedom and it's freedom in a good sense of that term um, and this is something i think that's so important to understand the polish context of john paul ii because in person and act he talks about the freedom of the person to become a, to freely um, achieve self-fulfillment, to fulfill one's own self. Mm -hmm. And in the Polish context, <clears throat> that means something entirely different than what it means in the American context, which I would, I would claim is the more popular contracts worldwide. You know, that's, right. that's exported through Hollywood and everything. Self-fulfillment, I want to go fulfill myself. So I'm going to leave my spouse and go marry a person of the same sex and do, you know, to have my transgender operation. Who knows? God knows what. That's their self-fulfillment. Whereas to John Paul II, it's the Polish self-fulfillment, which is restoring the integrity of the Polish soul by throwing off the foreign powers, both spiritually in terms of one's own soul, but also in the soul of the nation. And this is something that we actually see in real time in the Pontificate of John Paul II, which is so miraculous. But that is that I mean, that to me, that really is what makes his thoughts so compelling is because he's actually talking about a Catholic doctrine of freedom, mm. not the liberal doctrine of freedom, not the Marxist, because the Marxist doctrine of freedom is the poor overthrowing and killing the rich people and taking over the government. That's right. their idea of freedom. Right. And then the individual, you know, American idea of freedom is just do whatever you want to freedom. And also, so by, by John Paul II making a very, this, this personalism by creating this philosophical system of personalism, it utterly refutes both Marxism and the liberal liberalism sort of individual capitalist mindset, not, not capitalism in the, in the worst sense of that term, not, you know, shout out to my free market people. I'm, I'm just saying like the, the worst form of individualism, basically. So it refutes both of those completely. I forgot to mention national socialism because obviously Poland goes through this great passion of the 20th century, meaning a suffering yeah. under national socialism from the East, yeah. which is just a repeat of, of prior Prussian and German oppression. Yeah. That's just a repeat of the same thing they had before. And then we have Soviet communism from the East, which is again, another repeat of the same Russian domination they've been dealing with for decades and generations, which are both these anti-personalist systems. So the Polish context is, is, I think, is critical to understand how really powerful this whole magnum opus is. Now, one other bit of context that we, is worth mentioning is, 
the epigraph to person and act is a, a short quotation from one of the constitutions of Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, which I only recently learned that Foytiwa himself was one of the drafters of. Um, and um, I don't actually don't have the quote in front of you, me. Perhaps you do. Uh, do you have the, the line that he? Yeah, quotes? I'll get it in a second. I'm flipping to sure. it. Sure. It's um, the trend, the, the, um, it, yeah. And this is one of his interventions. What got him at Spes was one of John Paul II's favorite documents, but he criticized during the drafting committee, he criticized certain portions of it and said, we need to connect freedom more to truth. Hmm. Um, so here's, uh, yeah, got him at Spes number 76. And it says this, the church by reason of her role and competence is not identified in any way with the political community, nor bound to any political system. She is at once a sign and a safeguard of the transcendent character of the human person. Yeah. Pope Benedict said that John Paul II was sort of the authentic interpreter of Vatican II. Um, and so we have Pope Benedict and John Paul II both agree that this interpretation given is sort of the true understanding of Vatican II. Yeah. And this is, um, this work really, I am I think that he actually started, if I recall, I mean, George Weigel, he says that he started writing it when he was at Vatican II. Bishop Carol Voiti was at Vatican II, 62 to 65. And he starts writing and, and sort of making this philosophical foundation for much of the personalism that gets adopted at Vatican II. So Vatican II is so when Vatican II again. So if we take this Polish context, if we take this authentic interpretation, we understand that when when Vatican II talks about human dignity, talks about freedom, talks about all these different terms, and a lot of them are buzzwords for the American system. We understand that they're not the same thing as those buzzwords that we may, religious freedom, for example. We may you know we hear that in America, but it's not the same thing. So I think that that's a critical piece as well for understanding what is what should be the proper understanding of what Vatican II is getting at. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's get into then uh, the, the book itself. Now, um, it seems to be divided up into two large sections. And in the first half of it or so, he focuses a lot on discussing consciousness. And then uh, in the second half, he talks more about the act itself and what it reveals about the person, how it forms the person. Um, and I think in both of these cases, we can kind of uh, prelim make a preliminary point about how uh, his his philosophical method relates to the traditional um, Aristotelian Thomistic anthropology. Um, so first of all, in terms of the act. Why? Why does he? Why does he focus on the act? Um, there's this traditional saying um, in scholastic philosophy: opera, "Operari sequitur esse." Um, you know, an operation of things f follows its being, and um, uh, he points out that that goes both ways. Of course, yes, on a metaphysical level, you start with uh, the being, and its actions proceed from it, but. If a thing's actions also follow its being, then it then that also means that those actions reveal something about the nature of its being. I mean, we can see this with the soul, for instance. None of us uh, perceives um, our own soul directly. We perceive our soul through its operations, and that's true even on a kind of a metaphysical level. But he's he's focusing on human experience and what it can reveal about the act and the the acting person. Um, and, uh, so the other thing is about, about consciousness. Um, so he's, it's important to point out that this is not, what he's doing is he's trying to give an objective ca account of the subjective, which you touched on earlier. Um, and, and so that does not mean reducing human, uh, cognition, for instance, to the subjective, but He's trying to start with our experience of consciousness and how it relates to cognition, how the subjective relates to the objective, and do get as far as he can with experience. But he, he explicitly says, 
and perhaps this was not um, adequately presented in the original English translation, that he is working at least implicitly and sometimes explicitly within the the old framework, within the traditional Thomistic Aristotelian anthropology and their understanding of knowledge and those things. And so um, – yeah, so so he so he's basically trying to uphold realism, but by talking about the sources of knowledge, and this is a very uh, classical idea that all of our knowledge uh, begins with uh, sense experience. And now he's not just talking about se- sense experience, but about some things that are that are internal consciousness that are even more difficult to describe as well. Um, but this intuitive basis for knowledge, even metaphysical knowledge. Um, is very much a part of the Aristotelian and the Thomistic tradition. And what he's doing is trying to shine a light on that intuitive and that uh, that sort of subjective root for understanding things about ourselves and about the world. There was a really interesting uh, uh, a really interesting um, line in one of the uh, the subsequent, I think it was, I don't know if it was an essay or an address later in the book after Person and Act, where Wojtyla, there was this conference discussing Person and Act with all these Polish thinkers. A lot of them were priests. And he's sort of, uh, after the conference, Wojtyla himself is giving his his reflections on um, on the different comments that people had made about his work, how much he thinks they were accurate or what insights he particularly appreciated. Now, um, he f- he cites one Father Javorsky as referring to the healing of experience initiated by phenomenology. And Wojtyla says this, quote, has a great significance for the thinkers who represent a realistic position in philosophy, unquote. And so that gives you an, a sense of uh, partially the reason for the focus on consciousness and the subjective is that over the centuries, uh, various forms of philosophy emerged that tended to kind of um, sunder the subjective from the objective. Would you Would you agree with that? Um, right. I, I was trying to. Th- there's the quote that I was trying to find was when in the very few pa- first few pages he talks about how essentially um, Cartesianism, so Descartes and modern philosophy, basically took one aspect of man that's true namely the fact that the that man has a consciousness yeah. which is a true real fact and then they use that fact to exclude all the other facts about yeah. man and so sort of philosophy got locked in the consciousness and couldn't figure out a way out of the consciousness because of its own sin obviously and errors and whatnot but it was Edmund Husserl and phenomenology that kind of took it took that that playing field and then turn it on its mm. head by creating a philosophical system which took consciousness in modern philosophy and turned it towards realism for the first time since uh you know since plato basically yeah. so yeah so it's it's really interesting this healing of experience i mean if you think about the way that um subjectivity lived experience terms like that are are invoked today both in academic philosophy and in popular consciousness, even in politics, um, sort of identity poli- politics and things like that, you can see that there is this real, um, not even, not only just a sundering of the subjective of, uh, by the objective, but an inevitable domination of the objective by the subjective in many ways. Um and on the other on the other hand, I guess you could say conversely, with sort of enlightenment rationality and scientism and things like that, uh, in a sense, perhaps a domination of the subjective by the objective in some ways, in the sense that everything is reduced to a material reality. Um, and so, yeah. it reminds me actually of uh, Walker Percy no- Percy's novel Love in the Ruins, where he talks about this this phenomenon of angelism, bestialism. He's describing, uh, the protagonist is describing these scientists he works with who are these pure rational beings by day. And then at night they turn into these beasts are doing the most horrible, you know, base things. Um, and so there is this like real rift. And so I, I liked that phrase from Father Yavorsky about healing of experience through, 
through phenomenology um, because some people might ask, well, what's the point of all this? Isn't this just navel gazing with the subjective and don't, isn't it just obvious what's real? And unfortunately <laughs> to many people, um, yes, it is. It actually is obvious, but unfortunately we are living in an age that um, tr complicates the obvious uh, tremendously um, to, you know, to put it kindly. So, so I think that gives a sense of why these kinds of reflections can be useful. And I, I want to emphasize one aspect of about phenomenology, again, an Augustinian. So the reason I say I said earlier, Augustinian phenomenology was because there is a dispute among phenomenological scholars. Mm -hmm. They some say that Edmund Husserl turned to the dark side after his original great works. And so he became a subjectivist or an idealist or something after some say that that's that's the contention of some of his disciples, whereas others say no. But um one of the things that you're bringing up is the experience and why is it important to talk about an epistemological system which is connected with experience um one thing that that came to mind uh to explain this to to people who may have a more thomistic uh thought pattern um is to think about the fact that some things you can't really know the truth of until you experience them. So I can explain to you a sunrise and say, oh, sunrises are beautiful. They're, the sun comes up and there's all these colors and it's all beautiful. But until you actually experience a sunrise, that's when you really know what a sunrise, or, or even better, you can describe falling in love. You say, oh, falling in love is great. You fall in love, you love somebody, etc." or you get married, you know, but until you actually experience something, it's like, you don't really know. You don't really know what you're talking about. And this is most potently described in the uh, Christian tradition in St. Augustine's Confessions. St. Augustine's Confessions is a book about one soul's, one heart's experience with God. And it's been one of the most powerful books of the entire Western tradition. And there's something about the Confessions that's totally different than just reading a treatise about dogma. And Obviously, reading a treatise about dogma is critical. It's very important that we have a treatise about dogma. That's critical. Very, very important. I'm not denying that whatsoever. But that dogma needs to be experienced as true. You need to know, not only know about God, but know God himself, yeah. experience God as a person. And that's what St. Augustine does. So that's that's the reason why experience as a philo philosophical method is valuable. Now, it has limits, as you yeah. say. We, we shouldn't absolutize experience. We shouldn't say, well, well, I have an experience that is true, so therefore it's not true. That's, that's, not, that's not valid. But there is an aspect to the fact that experience does help one to know the truth. And this is what Fotiwa is exploring. Yeah, and, and it's also true that he is exploring it in part to discover its limits, not only to discover what it can teach us, but also to point out its limits and what's kind of on the border between consciousness and cognition and um, uh, all those various things. Yeah. Um, now, do you do you have a good sense of why? Um, so another another point on the relation to the sort of Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, um, you know, the focus he talks a bit about the focus on nature in that tradition, human nature. You know the intellect and the will man is a rational animal now um uh do, do you have a do you feel like you have a good grasp on why he finds it important to talk about the person uh sort of over and above nature i i mean i would what i would do is i would stress this quote here from from person and act um oh i hope i didn't just lose it i think i just lost it my bookmark came out okay oh no here it is here it is okay so page 116 he says, um, well, in, in another aspect, he, 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 tells, he, he talks about, as I said, the, the absolute, what he says, the absolutization, uh, absolutization of an aspect. That's what modern philosophy did. They, they absolutized this one aspect. But then on 116, he says, this study originates from the, the need to wonder at the human being, wonder, a wonder that constitutes the very first cognitive impulse. This is the best of the Greek philosophical tradition is that it starts from wonder. You, you experience something amazing and you wonder at it and then you want to know about it and know the truth yeah. of it. 
and so this is Plato, this is Socrates. Um, but Aristotle thought, of, you know, wondered at the human being, and he said, well, it seems that the nature of a human being is that he is a rational animal because he observed Aristotle's method is to is to look at the thing outside himself and to try to scientifically diagnose it and, and take a look at it um, and to look, reduce it to all its properties. So one of the one of the one of the sort of tendencies of Aristotomism is to reduce everything to its principal parts and to identify the different aspects of it, sort of break it all down and dissect it. And one of the things is this phrase rational animal, but the, so if, if the tendency of Aristotomism can sometimes be reductionism, if you will, the tendency of Augustinian phenomenology is to, uh, to maximize the maximum synthesis of the experiential truth, the, the experienced mm. truth. And so yeah. it is very much avoiding all of any sort of reductionism. That's sort of the tendency because this is Platonic. It's a Platonic method. Plato's always going to the universals, you know, the universal justice that li exists in the, the period of the forms. And I, and it, to, to that point that you're asking, so nature, so if you look at man's nature, you, th you see that he's a rational animal. That's his nature. And every nature has a telos, which uh, the end to which it, it tends. So all this is true, but there's a danger that it can actually reduce an individual human person and reduce him to sort of this rational animal uh, right. so that e every individual person is actually not something even greater than that. And I, I want to read this quote from this, this book that I highly recommend. It's called The Personalism of John Paul II. This is written by John F. Crosby, and it's just like a hundred page introduction. I think it's one of the best just really br easy breakdowns of wh what is so great about John Paul II's philosophy. Oh, great. And he has a quote here from page 28. He says this. so this is quoting John Paul II. Okay. So this is John Paul II's words. And he says this, we speak of individual animals looking upon them simply as single specimens of a particular animal species. And this definition suffices, but it is not enough to define man as an individual of the homo species, homo sapiens. And why not? Because each human being is more than just an instance of the human kind. We do not know a human being as a person if we know him only in terms of that which is common to all human beings. And one of the ways that we know this is by experience, because if we're just sort of only using the method of sort of a scientific Aristotelian framework, well, we're just going to die. We're just going to say everybody's just a rational animal because they are. You yeah. know, if you just sit in a tower and look out at all the people, and you say, well, they're all rational animals, but you never actually experience another person. You never fall in love with someone. You never have a friendship. You're never going to come to the conclusion. Well, maybe never, <laughs> but you probably won't come to the conclusion that. No, it's not just that you're a rational animal. You are a, an individual, unique person who yeah. is totally unrepeatable and totally unique and this amazing creation of God, just you only, even if nobody right. else existed. Right. And so that experience of the person drawing from that is what really, um, really is able to face these dangers of the 20th century that we had previously mentioned. Uh, because if we just talk about rational and animal and we just sort of have this sort of, and you know, in fairness here, you know, St. Thomas has all sorts of other aspects. It's not, you know, obviously man is created in the image of God. He's, you know, half, he's the angel, he's related to the angels, but related to the animals. So there's a lot more to the St. Yeah. Thomas and the Aristotelian system. But if, if we're, if we're just using the phrase rational animal, we need to, that's why the, the term person is so much better and more superior when talking right. about ethics and, and all these different things that are going on. Um, yeah, you know. and he he points out, you know, it's in that he's not denying the traditional anthropology at all, but he's saying it is it is it is the nature, so to speak, of a rational animal to be to always be a person, and so yeah, within right. that, nice. yeah, so it's not so nature. He talks about nature is kind of what's determined, but the person. It's not that we have freedom to contradict our nature, but there is a sort of transcendent character to it maybe oh yeah that's that that's a play. really great breakdown that you just said because yes the the natural the nature of the rational per ra rational animal is to be a person so you can't change that but then the person himself determines 
his self-fulfillment or not. And and John Paul II says, you fulfill yourself through your freedom and through your act, your integrated act, which reveals your person, and yeah. you are self-fulfilled as a person if and only if your action conforms to the ethical norm. Yeah. If it does not conform to the ethical norm, you're actually destroying your own personhood. Yeah. And certainly to your nature, but not just your nature as a rational creature, but to your nature specifically as a as a person. Yeah. Um so all right. Um I I really appreciated the um Actually, before we move on, my favorite single sort of like punchy quote from the book, um, and I don't even remember what part of the book this is from, but it relates to what we were just saying is, man is constantly a task for himself. He is entrusted to himself as a task, and every time, in every action, volition, choice, and decision, he is being d entrusted anew. So I think from the outset, we can say, you know, uh, that the the upshot one of the big upshots of this book is to give you a greater sense of man's responsibility another really important word for Voitiwa and John Paul II in related to his philosophy of freedom um man's responsibility to form himself so he talks about in each of the half i like how the the two big halves of the book kind of mirror each other in various ways when he talks about consciousness and action and one of those ways is that in both cases consciousness not only reflects the uh uh the person but it also constitutes uh the person's self knowledge and it actually forms the person because self knowledge is is not just a mirror but it is actually part of the fulfillment of the person likewise with action action not only reflects uh, the essence of a person of a being, which I talked about earlier, um, but it also fulfills and constitutes that being. And so, um, so that that sense of responsibility, not only for your actions and their external um, objects, uh, but for uh, for oneself, first and foremost, which I think really goes along with and he talks at the end, he has this sort of addendum about how that fits into participation in the community and your responsibility for others. But I think he's quite right and very traditional in saying one's first responsibility is for uh, for oneself, um, not in a selfish way, but in the sense that we are the only one whose sort of eternal destiny is is put in our hands, <laughs> you know. Uh, in a sort of an immediate way. Um, and so I, I think that um, so far from being navel gazing and self centered and myopic, I think it really fits in with that traditional idea of ultimately, uh, you know, yes, we, we are saved uh, in a communal way, um, but ultimately we are each primarily responsible for working out our own salvation and fear and trembling and and uh and it would be improper to uh focus on other things on doing uh doing uh some kind of misguided attempt to do good for others without uh without attending to the state of our own souls to put it in more traditional terms yeah the the um the action of the person the person who does evil becomes evil yeah. and the person who does good becomes himself good and so yeah. the action is done and the action reflects the person reveals the person and also reflects back and creates the person and makes the person good or evil um so if you don't mind i'd like to go to uh his talk of consciousness probably my favorite part of the book the relationship between consciousness cognition self-knowledge lived experience um uh we talked a little bit about this this rift between the subjective and the object uh, objective of the cartesian cartesian approach um which kind of spirals you know into modernity um one one kind of uh you hear people talk about consciousness these days even uh and apparently at Voitiwa's time as well as though consciousness is sort of identical with um intellect you know uh with with rationality with like the whatever higher capacity we have human beings have for thinking and willing um uh you know the materialist 
uh, approach is to we're studying consciousness by you know putting attaching wires to somebody's brain, <laughs> you know that that kind of thing. Um, and there tends to be this kind of uh, making consciousness itself into the like the sort of the substance behind human intellection. And uh, Wojtyłyn says consciousness is a function; it's not a substance. It reveals the subject to itself, but the subject stands outside or at the foundation of consciousness. Um, and in consciousness, he says, human subjectivity is shaped and manifested to itself. But it always has this sort of back and forth relationship with what he would call cognition, the sort of objective knowledge. Um, and I think it's really fascinating the way he describes this kind of mutual feedback between consciousness and cognition, which lives to what we might call an authentic lived experience and a really intuitive self-knowledge. Um, so um, consciousness is not co cognition because it basically just mirrors and helps us to interiorize or subjectivize what we already know. Um, cognition is the actual the actual process in which we we come to know things objectively. Um, now he talks about understanding as a different term, and he says it's understanding that helps experience fulfill itself in its proper cognitive character um so so he 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 uses this matter form uh way of speaking uh that in human cognition experience would be the matter and understanding would be the form and now you might think okay so i've got this intuitive experience and then over and above that i've got this cognition and so um it just starts with with experience and intuition and consciousness and then uh, cognition sort of ascends ever higher and higher. And one of the dangers in that approach or that way of thinking about it is that cognition eventually sort of loses its grounding in the concreteness of experience and consciousness. Um, now, certainly that includes sense, sense experience, but isn't, uh, isn't sense knowledge, but isn't totally reducible to that. Um, but actually he, he describes this way in which understanding or cognition, they don't depart further and further from experience, but they actually result in new and ever deeper intuitions. In fact, he says, and again, I think this is a very traditional uh, position, that perfect intuition is the actual proper end of what we would describe as discursive reason, where we're sort of thinking step by step rationally through something in an abstracted way. Um, and as you said, we're not meant to merely know about God, for instance, but we're meant to know God, know God directly. This is the two, the two ends of man. Traditionally, people, there's a debate. Is knowledge of God uh, mainly what we're going to be doing in heaven or is love of God mainly what we're going to be doing in heaven? And, and so I think when you look at this actual unity between uh, experience and cognition that, de that can develop such that um, they are kind of a single intuitive act. Um, I think that we can sort of solve that seeming divide between knowledge and love. And this is something that's very much indicated in the Old Testament way of speaking of marital love, right? Of, uh, of loving as knowing someone. Um, you know, Mary says, how can this be when I had not known a man? Now, uh, that's not merely a euphemism you know, uh, to, to avoid saying, you know, sexual intercourse, that, that actually is revealing something really revealing something deeper, uh, about what, what this kind of marital relation is. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to go on forever. I have more to say about it, but I want to let you jump in, Tim, if you have any comments on that. Well, that that's a very profound consideration that you just said about sort of the, the Thomistic and Franciscan debate over, knowledge of God or love of God, uh, which is uh, vulgar, vulgarly uh, boiled down to sort of intellect versus will, but it's more complicated than that. Right, right. Um, and um, I, I, I can't help but thinking in this, what you just said, which was a very profound comment um, that I, I never thought of, um, but I, I can't help but thinking right now about uh, Teacher von Hildebrand because his philosophical contribution to this whole discussion is to uh, meditate philosophically on the role of the heart and the heart mm. being the spiritual center of the person, which sort of 
is, is the there's the intellect and the will and there's the heart which sort of brings your whole personhood together so that when you when you interact with another person you are as newman said the heart speaks to the heart and it sort of becomes the axis of the person in a sense um and that's a very profound uh I, it makes me think back into that based on what you just said um so uh it's i, I mean th this is ultimately this is such a profound ultimately this whole book has really made me so much more um it, in my best days in my best moments more reverent or, or try to be more reverent towards an individual person and how hmm. every individual person is so complex there's so much depth and that's why you know you get married to someone you get to know them for the rest of your life uh, or you just have us you know the strong friendships that you build with another individual and how powerful it is to just know someone else just as a friend and right. to know them and for years and years and years and how um the the great uh the great wonder that each individual person is you know sometimes it, it, it's really helped me you know because it's easy for people to get lost in the numbers nowadays we live in this internet world where you know we get oh ten thousand people died over here or oh, gunman shot up 12 people they died all these numbers so persons are reduced to all these numbers and you just get overwhelmed You're like wow all these people are this and that and you kind of you start to feel like you should bear the responsibility for all of these things that are really in God's hands. God is the providential master. He's the king of the universe. He's the one dealing with all these persons. And when I, when I step out of that world and then I step into the world of the person where all I, then I start to just meditate on this person right in front of me right now, you and I are just talking right now and we're interacting as persons and, you know, I'm going to go and talk with my wife and my children or whatever. And this, all of this reality that Voitiwa attempts to unravel, and this is just a sliver of the person. This is a huge 600 page philosophical text, which attempts to peel back the, the wonder. So when, when I start to exist in that world, then I'm, I'm in a world of wonder. And I'm, and I can, I can, but at the same time, I'm not overwhelmed by that world of wonder. I'm actually drawn into that world of wonder. And so it's sort of the, the beauty of the, the individual, the nobility and the beauty of each individual person is what this text ultimately, I think, achieves in some small way. And it helps bring us back to that, which I think is, is just more real. That's the real world. Whereas the world of numbers and all this stuff, that's not the real world. There's a certain unreality to that, I think, because mm -hmm. yes, it's obviously all those things are real. People are real out there, but it's just not something that you have control over. Or I think that you were really, God really designed you to deal with all that. You know, right, <laughs> like, right. it's just, uh, it's just another world that's sort of ephemeral and, and, not quite natural, I think, not right. according to our nature. Yeah, no, I agree. That's a great point, Tim. Um, so I'd like to, to talk a little bit more about this mutual feedback between consciousness and cognition, just to give the listener an idea of, um, obviously, don't want to get too far into the details. But um, so so he starts with this, uses this traditional term suppositum, meaning the the ontological subject. You start with that. Then you've got what he calls mirroring consciousness in which man is given to himself as his own I, meaning that he experiences himself as a subject. Um, and along with that mirror, part of that mirroring consciousness is also consciousness of consciousness, consciousness that I have consciousness. Then from there you get reflectivity on consciousness, which is where you get the, the objective, the objectivization of that awareness. So that, that sort of experience turns into knowledge of man acting and of man acting consciously. Then you get what he calls reflexivity, uh, which is the resubjectivization re of the objective self-knowledge so that it's integrated and experienced subjectively. So it's not only that the, the subjective experience needs to be um, objectivized and, and evaluated and properly integrated into the objective uh, cognition, but also that the cognition uh, needs to be reintegrated and experienced subjectively. And then that reflexivity 
produces what he calls lived experience with a dash between the two words, uh, which he calls the final and definitive mode of consciousness. It not only mirrors the subject, but it also constitutes the subject in an experiential way. Um, and actually, in this way, he says spirituality, as a side note, he says spirituality, which strictly speaking exists outside of experience and is reads through reasoning, manifests itself experientially, which I thought was interesting. But um, this idea that um, it's not, we don't have true lived experience. Our experience has not been authentically lived until it is sort of, uh, <laughs> it's, I don't know why I just had the image because I watched a, like an old silent film documentary about the making of a samurai sword where they like fold this metal repeatedly and compact it until it's really strong. Basically you have to have this back and forth motion between cognition and consciousness until it, everything gets sort of integrated in this really unified manner. Um, and Part of the reason I wanted to go into that is it touches on this phenomena that he describes called emotionalization of consciousness. Um, and I think this is very relevant today. This idea of lived experience almost becomes an idol, proper, uh, improperly understood in our time. Just to give an example, I, I remember hearing several years ago um, from certain people, uh, we'd be having a discussion or even a debate about something, uh, let's say, you know, Catholic feminism or something like that. And, and, uh, you know, I'd make a point or ask a question and they'd be like, you're dismissing my lived experience. And I'm like, well, no, I, I actually, I have nothing to say about your experience. I, your experience is valid as far as it goes. I, I have no problem with your experience. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the universal here, you know, or I'm talking, or even maybe not the universal, I'm talking about statistics here. The, the fact that you've experienced something, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, do away with, you know, the the more universal realities, or vice versa. The universal, the more universal realities, they don't necessarily, uh, if if you have an experience that is an outlier in some way, they don't necessarily do away with that as well. But I remember kind of feeling like they cite their own experience as though um, experience is sort of self authenticating as though it's not possible for us to misinterpret our own experience, as though we are the sort of definitive arbiter and, and that our own personal experience allows us to make universal statements because of some special expertise of suffering or something, you know? Um, and, and so Wojtyla talks about this emotionalization of consciousness, which I think is relevant. He says that in emotionalized consciousness, it occurs when emotions and sensations exceed our comprehension and they result in a collapse of self-knowledge, the emotions being too strong or the self-knowledge too weak for consciousness to maintain its objectivity. The main focus of consciousness, consciousness, he says, becomes not knowledge or acts, but what happens in me. Because earlier he's made this distinction between what happens in man and the actual actions of man. What happens of man are things like, you know, our digestive processes or breathing, things like that, um, and and things that we may experience, but that we don't experience as caused by an act of the will. So if it gets bad enough, this emotionalization of consciousness, we perceive it as something that happens, losing connection with the I in which it happens. So emotions are mirrored. They're still mirrored, but they're not mediated by understanding in this kind of mutual feedback that I discussed. And so that goes along with the emotionalization of lived experience. So man lives by emotion objectively rather than fully, that is cognitively experiencing it subjectively. So what's really interesting is we have this, this modern ideology of lived experience where it's considered to be the, that's the really only authentic thing. And, you know, abstract reasoning is not authentic, you know. Um, but he's actually saying that unless cognition is properly integrated with your consciousness and your, your experience, it's not a fully lived experience. You are failing to fully live your experience. You're experiencing it on a raw level that is actually not commensurate with your rational nature or with your personal nature. And so I think that's such a great rejoinder to this cult of this false, false cult of lived experience. Um, and, and so what he actually says is that you're allowing, you're not, you're not experiencing things anymore. You're just allowing these things to live in you and off you in 
what he describes as an impersonal way. So I just think that's a brilliant insight. Yeah, absolutely. I and um this is uh yeah, this was that was one of my favorite parts in the book, the emotionalization of consciousness and how uh the emotions, if the emotion of a strong emotions which sort of takes control of your will and your consciousness, it sort of defines your truth, but you haven't self-reflected on the what that is. And what's really profound is that um, if, on the other hand, you you truly have the integration of the person, that's one of my favorite terms of Voitio was integration. You have an integration of all of your, the different aspects of man in your personhood, then, so then you have efficacy, which is the the true free act of one's will through self-consciousness and self-knowledge and the emotional re reaction to truth, the experience of truth. And what happens is I, I thought thought of found this, this this great quote here uh, on page 214, where he says that um, what happens is there's a synthesis of objectivity objectivity is proper to action insofar as its dynamic core is self-determination identifiable with the lived experience of i will so you are willing something you're acting upon it and you're experiencing the fact that you did it freely you chose that through self-reflection through this whole act of your will and then he says self-determination places one's own i that is the subject in the position of the object it then realizes the objectivity of one's own eye in subjectivity. So basically you are discovering that you are a person. Yeah. You're discovering I'm experiencing that I am a person. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and on the other hand, you can experience, you, you can experience what it feels like to not be treated like a person by somebody else. Right. And, and if someone's not treating you like a person, you can feel that and you can experience that. But on the other hand, if you are acting like a person, uh, you know, uh, truly not just allowing your emotions to take control, but you are truly acting through self-knowledge in accordance with the with the the ethical norm. You are fulfilling yourself. You are doing good and becoming good. Then you experience that you are a person. You're acting according to your own personhood. And I yeah. think that the, one of the most powerful things about this is that what it does is the as we said, the the tradition that's passed down, Aristotomism, etc., says really this, much of the same thing in terms of what you just said, you know, in terms of, you know, the passions that they, you know, the reason should, right. the reason should govern the passions and whatnot. But by using experience to explain the same thing, it's St. John Paul II is, is speaking to modern man sort of in his own language, in yeah. a way that he can really understand. You know, if, if we talk to most modern men and we try to, talk about intellect and will and irrational passions and concubinal appetite and all these sort of Thomistic distinctions, they're not going to have the faintest idea what you're talking about, unless they're just right. very philosophically astute. But if you talk about, hey, did you, exp how did it feel when that person, you know, or, or, you know, when you cohabitated with your, you know, girlfriend, wife, whatever, or, you know, when you were, when that person didn't treat you well, when that man, didn't marry you and just wanted to fornicate with you. What, how did that feel? You felt like you were abused. You felt like you weren't treated like a person. You felt yeah. like you were abandoned, that you deserve better. Well, that's experiencing. So you're talking about there's sort of this experience of the personhood or not. And that's yeah. something that really speaks to modern man in a way that he can understand in, in a lot of ways. And so that's what I think is so very powerful and potent about uh, this text. Right. And in a time when there's an increasing resentment of the idea of human nature as a limit on our freedom, not just on our freedom uh, in the sense of, you know, what's really interesting, it just occurred to me in the middle of that sentence is that, you know, we talk about this sort of libertarian idea of freedom, right? This modern idea of freedom contrasted with the, the Polish or the, the Wojtyla, the church's understanding of freedom, right? Um, freedom being able to do what you want. But with this identity, with this, let's let's look at sort of gender identity stuff, you know. Um, now, you can say people want the freedom to choose their gender identity, but what they what they actually invoke in their arguments, whether in good faith or not, is 
I want to be I want to be who I really am. I want to be free to be who I really am. It's almost like they're turning back to the idea of freedom as fulfilling your nature, except they don't believe in nature. It's just the person sort of <laughs> almost divorced from from human nature. And so um uh, the reason I mention is that is that you know th this approach to this through experience that you just mentioned it also shows that it's not just that you're just being dominated by uh your own nature and sort of having to check these boxes and act in a way befitting a rational animal it's also showing that you're not even unless you're unless you're behaving in a in a rational manner you're not even authentically experiencing your own experiences so it connects that that thing of the authenticity that people want to feel with them with themselves with the demands of rationality uh, which i don't know that's just some something that only just occurred to me um I, yeah I, and i want to put this in the historical context as you just pointed out uh but the, the gender theory and all these crazy and things that we're dealing with now all of this is just the bitter fruit of divorce i would say <laughs> divorce which is the fruit of contraception all these other aspects mm. but when I, would, I mean, I would even put divorce as one of the prime reasons. I mean, we homosexuality is just a fruit of that it, divorce when because why is this all this stuff we're talking about is so important is because that is the natural progression of every single person who is born as a child and the, the child grows and the child experiences emotions. That's that's what you know, the, before the age of reason, a child is just a ball of emotion and the father and mother, their job is to go through this exact process that Voitiwa is, is to form this exact process that you just described in terms of consciousness is to slowly help the child to understand that he is a person, that he needs to reflect on his actions, to understand himself, to understand when he hits his younger child or you know, his younger sister, that hurts her and it hurts him too. And he needs yeah. to stop doing that because he needs to conform his personhood to the reality of who he is. But at the same time, and to time, understand that his sister is a person, to understand yeah, by analogy, understand his, yeah. yeah, and just understand his, his 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 sister is a person. But at the same time, to also find out who he he really is, yeah. realize I am a person. I have this personality. I'm I'm a phlegmatic, or I'm a choleric, or. I really like to do this, or I find a, I just discovered that I'm talented in this way, or, you know, this whole self realization in a good way, which is the normal process of every single child to adulthood, every single child to adulthood, which gets interrupted and destroyed by divorce and the breakdown of marriage. Right. And all sorts of other fruits, bitter fruits that come from that. So right. the, what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with all these children who have been traumatized by their parents who may or may not have been married. And now they're adults and now they're traumatized and they're they're acting out all this trauma because they went never went through this proper process they've emotionalized their consciousness they're self-identifying with their emotions so i'm an x i'm a z i'm a lg whatever word it is because you didn't go through this with your parents you didn't go through all this stuff or you're even worse perhaps i don't know if this is worse but your parents actually encourage that maybe <laughs> nowadays i mean right unfortunately that's the case now so um, but I think that that's really the historical context is that if God created the family so that mom and dad could through this immense act of love that they, because the child is literally in, in, in a very literal, real experiential sense, a part of their own personhood, uh, their, their children is related, are related to them in their own personhood. And that's how they can form them in this this whole process of person and act is through the family great man yeah that's that's a great point now if i can just i have one quote from voitiwa that i think kind of sums up uh a good takeaway for people here um he says the coherence of self-knowledge with consciousness should be considered the basic factor of the equilibrium of the person's interior life especially concerning its intellectual structure so we want to just not have abstract knowledge or just raw consciousness. We want to have those two things integrated. And obviously that's very relevant for the life of faith, um, the life of the spirit, especially in a, t in a, in a, in a time when Catholicism, Orthodox Catholicism tends to be dominated by intellectualism or apologetics, things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's most important that we truly live by these things, um, not just in the behavioral sense, but in the, in the, sense of consciousness 
uh, and integrate personal integration as well. Um, and the other thing, which will lead us to a little bit of a discussion of action, um, is he also points out that consciousness gives morality its full dimension because it allows us to experience the good or evil of an act together with what you just mentioned, our efficacy of the act. And by this subjectivization, I experience good or evil in myself, simply speaking, not just in my act. So I, I not only experience my act as good or evil, but I experience myself as good or evil. Um, and so that's that's a very uh, that's also obviously a very important link to the discussion of action. Um, now I don't know how much you want to talk about action. Obviously, it's part of the title of the book. We should discuss it somewhat. Um, but uh, I think um, we can say briefly that uh, he he talks about, and we don't need to get into the technical details. But he talks about how each act contains. The dynamic of the entire person it integrates and expresses the dynamic of the entire person so that in a really significant sense the person discovers himself as a person through his actions because it's it's that in which all of the different aspects of his spiritual and biological psychosomatic all the different terms he uses dynamism are brought together from what what happens in man is even as i described before is also put to to the service of man acting um but uh i think probably what we really want to focus on and correct me if there's anything else here you want to talk about is the relationship of uh the relationship between uh the will acts of the will and truth um and uh he he talks about um well i guess one one preliminary that i should say again, relating this to the traditional philosophy that he was trained in, um, he points out that the, this work, Person and Act, is not concerned with the specific content of ethics. It's more concerned with the, if you can call it that, the sort of moral and ethical character of acting as such, just acting pure and simple and how it relates to the person and morality. So he's not getting into the details of morality and ethics, but it's more like the whole category, the whole experience of morality and ethics as such. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah. What's, what's so powerful about this text is that it's, it's building an entire philosophical system, which ends up proving the transi transcendence of man and the necessity of ethics and all of these other things and spiritual things without even getting into that stuff. And it's sort of a purely rational look at this sort of thing without even getting into that stuff necessarily. Going back to this modern libertarian view of freedom, which also goes back to certain medieval eras, you know, Ockham is also, uh, William of Ockham is often blamed, sort of the, the voluntarism that develops in the late Middle Ages. Um, basically, the idea that freedom is indetermination with regard to objects of the will. It's essentially that we are sort of the will is kind of indifferent towards its objects and not not more inclined towards one than the other. And it's just kind of almost an arbitrary choice that we make. There's a number of reasons why it can't be just reduced to this inter indetermination. One of the reasons, he says, is that, uh, as he puts it, uh, volitum, uh, willing, presupposes cognitum, thinking. Um, and, and he says that choosing involves, quote, a certain subordination to truth and not cert simply a mere relation to objects, unquote. And this is why, uh, part of the reason that our will, it responds to motives, but it's not determined by them. It's kind of both the reason that, um, it's kind of both the reason that, that the will is not determined by its object, but the objects, but the will is not totally indifferent to its objects as well. I don't know if I'm getting that right, but that's my my attempt to explain why the relation to truth helps us to understand the nature of, of freedom, not just being indetermin indeterminate, uh, yes. indeterminacy towards objects. The, the, tru the truth about the good is, is one of his phrases. You, you have right. to know that this thing I want to do is good, and because I know that, now I can do it. Yeah. And that is attempting to experience or interact and have a relationship with objective truth that has nothing to do with whether or not you exist or what you're perceiving. You, The very structure of the whole thing 
is an attempt. I mean, even even what you just said, like the transgender, whatever queer theory is, is um, I want to be who I really am. Well, that yeah. statement itself is an attempt to interact with objective truth, even though it's subjectivized right. because like yeah, that yeah. statement proves the fact that you have to subordinate your person to objective truth. Right. Because you are yeah. like the very structure of your you can't even make an argument without saying I'm trying to seek the truth about the good. Uh, they just don't right. realize it, you know. Right. right but right. Uh, that's that's yeah. what you're getting at. Yeah. So so what he says is that dependence on the truth makes the will independent of its objects and their presentation, the way that they're presented to his his cognition and his will, while giving the person superiority over his own dynamism his own kind of everything that's going on in him and he refers to that of the as the transcendence of the person in the act and so um there is this there is this transcendence and it has a personal character um because it's not simply determined by external forces is not simply even determined by the nature of the person although it is conditioned by that um and should be fulfilled in in an appropriate relationship with with human nature but um so he's, he even goes so far as he says the indetermination with regard to objects of the will which is colloquially what we call freedom today um he just says that's just a secondary effect of this self-determination where the person is sort of superior to any given part of himself because all of these things are united and sort of transcended uh, they're, they're united, integrated in the act, like I said before, but also then the person transcends those dynamisms in the act because of its relationship to truth. I know that's kind of a roundabout way of saying it, but uh, I'm doing my best. Yeah, I mean that that's and that's the, like you said, that's the that's the um, epi epigraph of the whole text is this quote from Vatican II that it's the transcendence of the person, and what's so powerful uh, is that this text illustrates how the very structure of the person manifests that transcendence that the personhood is connected with something beyond and someone beyond himself and you can see that just by the very nature of the person itself as vatican one says dogmatically that we can know that god exists purely by reason without even revelation right right, right. um one thing i wanted to talk about is how does the experience of action lead to duty? So there's this, there's this, this common place that you can't get an is, uh, sorry, you can't get an ought from an is. Um, just knowing what something is does not tell you how things ought to be or how you ought to act in relation to them. That's, that's a very common thing to hear um, in sort of modern moral or philosophical discourse. Um, Wojtyla contradicts this. The way that I, I, I'll admit I'm a little fuzzy on some of this stuff, but um, but he, he talks about how, um, you know, man's consciousness is not just reflecting its objects, mirroring them passively. We have this mind that stands at a distance from our objects and above them, as I was just saying, because of our mind's subordination to truth, which is in a superiority that he says is essential for personhood. And um, truth has this normative power, which appears in our consciousness, in our experience of action, and even our experience of cognition, um, as the linking of truthfulness with duty. So he says, it is in conscious, sorry, I'll quote him here. It is in conscience that the particular linking of truthfulness with duty takes place, the linking that is manifested as the normative power of truth. The human person in his every act is an eyewitness of the transition from is to should, from X is truly good to I should perform X. Um, so it seems like he's overcoming this by just by pointing out that, that that's simply not how we experience reality. Um, he, he's he's right. saying, well, you can make this you can make this claim that you can't get a not from an is. But in fact, baked into our experience of of is is 
immediately following on that a sense of ought. And so he's, it seems like he's kind of saying it's like futile. It's just futile to deny that 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 is how we experience things and that that reflects reality. And that that is something that's drawn from Max Shaler and Max Shaler, because Hmm. Max Shaler's philosophical system is all about you experience value in everything and every person. You experience something of value, whether that is that sunset or that person. And by experiencing the truth about the good of an object or a person, there then manifests concurrently an ought. There is yeah. a response to that value. How am I going to respond to that? And that's just something that everybody experiences. And if you just explain that, everyone will say, yes, I ex- I've experienced that before. And that's what makes it a reality of the subjective. Yeah. And he, he also emphasizes quite a bit that morality is kind of the experience of morality is kind of central to the transcendence of the person um and and he says that because when we have that sense of i should perform x or that sense of duty um that linking of truthfulness and duty um it it's in that most of all that we open ourselves towards those values that we you just mentioned that we that we find in things um at the same time, though, moral responsibility isn't just responsibility for external values. I should treat so and so in this way, or I should treat this animal in this way, or I should, you know, treat the the, the earth in this way, whatever it might be. Um, but it's also a responsibility for one's own fulfillment, which goes back to that quote, which I'll give again because it's such a great quote. Man is constantly a task for himself. He is entrusted to himself as a task, and every time in every action volition, choice, and decision, he is being entrusted anew. Um, so, you know, we, I've, I guess we've talked a lot more about consciousness than about action per se, um, but I think that the understanding of consciousness and how it, res- how it relates to cognition and needs to be integrated with it is very important in understanding our experience of action as well. Yeah, I mean, there's just this whole world of the person in the subjective which is finally manifested in the act. So this yeah. book just sh- it really shows the depth of an act. You see an act externally, but there's all this depth within the person's subjective reality uh, that is sort of hidden to a degree, but it is manifested at least in in partial form in the act. Uh, now, Tim, we're going to wrap up soon, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about something I know you were interested in discussing, which is the relationship between the moral responsibility to oneself that I just mentioned and how that connects to social responsibility and community. Oh, well, I mean, this this goes into the the what what Wojtyla is doing, and he mentions this at the end of the book and in, and in the post essays in this volume, is how he's refuting in in very a very powerful way by penetrating the truth he's refuting the individualism and the marxism as we said by by taking uh by t- having this personalism then we have instead of individualism a social and and familiar structure of individualism and instead of a totalitarian system against both of those he proposes the communio personarum, which is a phrase also in Vatican II and in subsequent magisterial texts, that there is really a community of persons. And that's what the family is. And that's what society is. And that's what the only structure that is possible for anything is not a political community, as the first quote said. We're not saying a particular form of politics works, except to say that these forms are anti-personal. Uh, right. You know, this this can be properly worked out in a monarchy or democracy or whatever, but it can't be done in a communist system because that's purely anti-personal. The individualist system is tends towards anti-personal, but it's not intrinsically. It could become a good communal person arm. Um, but the phrase that he uses is that part because the final text of the final chapter of person and act is called participation which is where you participate, you are acting as a person, and then you participate in the personhood of another person. And then you're acting together. And this is the experience and reality of the communion, the communion, the community of persons, which is the best terminology to describe the true reality, which 
underscores the morale, the moral dimension, the the and the social dimension of those those um, moral norms, uh, flowing straight out of this this whole philosophical system, which is not even ethical. It it just it's just the this uh, epistemological system that that he's he's making, which right. undergirds the whole system of ethics is this these philosophical realities. Right. Yeah. Um, now, this is a pretty challenging book. We talked about that. Um, one thing I noticed in reading it is that the uh, it's see, I, I couldn't tell if he was repeating himself in certain parts. Like I couldn't tell if he, he if he was repeating what he had just said or if he was developing it so subtly that I just wasn't wasn't perceiving it. And I asked the translator about this. And what he said is that um, because he's so determined, so concerned with not reducing things to any one element and and not isolating one ele element in a in a detrimental way that sort of in each section he spends a lot of time kind of recapitulating what had come up to that point and showing how it's integrated into the point that he's about to make which which makes sense because it can be a very I sometimes I couldn't tell how much of the difficulty of reading the book was due to the subject matter and how much of it was due to the writing style but I I, I now understand a lot of it is because he is so s trying to keep everything integrated as closely as possible together and so that he he tends to write in this almost like circular way where he circles around each point before finally like hitting it and then he re sort of recapitulates that all into the next into the next point it's kind of a unique a unique style yeah and, I, and george george weigel in his biography talks about again how the polish ethnic identity helps inform this very unique and what as anglo western americans we we might think as idiosyncratic or kind of weird but it's it's much more a, a sort of bridge between East and West. When you think about the Eastern liturgy, for example, it's far more sort of circular and recapitulating. The Greek rite is again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord again and again in peace, let us mm. pray to the Lord. And so there's this constant uh, l sort of circular deepening, if you will. It's like a, it's like a circle that goes towards the center as opposed to the, the Western mind and the Western liturgy very much is A, B, C, you know, Kyrie, Gloria, Agnus Dei, you know, the communion, etc. So there's sort of a very linear mind. So it, it, it's very, uh, his his thought is very much a, a synthesizing thought, uh, which is difficult, to, especially for us to understand, but right. it really brings in sort of this more Eastern mind, Eastern Christendom mind, which is, Interesting. I, I think, very powerful. Now, um, not we're of course hoping some people will listen to this and read that, pick up this translation of Person and Act and read it. And we're certainly not discouraging people from doing that. But being realistic, many people will not find it within themselves to do that, or they don't have time, or whatever. So, uh, Tim, I know you had a few secondary sources that you were interested in and in recommending quickly uh, that people yeah, might also be um, interested in. Right. So I, I find, um, you mentioned the Crosby book already. Yeah. So th this one I think is the easiest book for beginners. That's the easiest one to read. Yeah. It's like, it's 92 pages. The other one is Rocco Butiglione, Carol of Oitiwa, the thought of the man who became Pope John Paul II. Now he's an Italian, but he's an Italian who learned Polish in order to mm. understand Carol of Oitiwa. And yes. That's something as as we talked about translation issues before. Knowing Polish is critical in some aspects to understand the deeper nuances of all these subtleties. Um, so that's a really really good text too. But that's a that's a lot harder than the Crosby book. But I think the hardest thing is actually to read Person and Act, which right. I think both of us would agree we we don't really understand the half of it. I mean, it's so deep and, yeah. and profound and dense and difficult, and even Polish speakers find it difficult too. So. Um, but yeah, those, that are, those said, are two stories. Discussing it with you oh. has been very helpful. Yeah. It's, um, hey, make a, make a reading group. Oh, I want to recommend this book too. This is not, a, but this is another great introduction. Um, especially for like people like us who, you know, we're younger and, and we may have not experienced, I mean, I know I wasn't even Catholic when John Ball II was the Pope, so yeah. I never really experienced John Ball II as a I was pope. a kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, 
you, you know, George Weigel's biography is very exhaustive, but it's also a huge text. Yes. This is a really great text that just came out. It's called A Pope for All Seasons by Angelico Press. And it's just a bunch of conversations with people who knew John Paul II and what and who he was. And so this is that's a really great introduction to why, you know, why do all of these older generation Catholics, why are they so uh, yeah. Why do they love John Paul II so much? I mean, that's the question. And this book gives the answer. So uh, that's called A yes. Pope for All Seasons. Yeah, I, I have it. I've read some of it. It's it's good. I read the interview with his secretary, uh, now Cardinal Jewish, who was standing right next to him when he was shot and just talking about the details of that day. Also, his his sort of photographer who worked in the Vatican from a very young age as a photographer and was right there taking photos of him. <laughs> Right after he got he got wow. shot almost by instinct, it was very in, uh, intense to read. Tim, I'm so appreciative that, of you for sharing this experience with me, and uh, <laughs> it was it was a great idea of, on your part, I think, if I remember correctly, to to sort of read this concurrently. And so uh, it's been been very helpful, and particularly this discussion, you you did such a great job of bringing it to things that are relevant and people can understand why some of these things are are important so yeah really appreciate it man oh it's a joy i love talking with you i'm so glad that we have our uh just constant dialogue we talk about things in private we talk about things in public and it's just great to be your friend and and work together for catholic culture that's right there you go um now uh so you can you can find tim's work over to um some older material which is uh uh is it jake fowler is his name he did a series on yeah. the ecumenical councils um mm -hmm. which is which is cool i just started listening to that the other day i really enjoyed i mentioned in the last episode we did, did together your series with gideon lazar about uh, the five books of the pentateuch really cool informative stuff there um and uh you know maybe we'll maybe we'll do this again with a, f a subsequent volume of this uh series why not if we're gonna read it you know yes god willing um, yeah yeah great so everybody who's listening thank you for listening if you've listened to this whole thing please do remember we catholicculture.org we're in the middle of uh at the very beginning i should say of our uh may fundraising campaign if we don't succeed in this campaign we won't be able to continue uh for the rest of the year so uh please consider donating anything that you uh give up through May 24th will be doubled thanks to our thanks to our generous donors providing a matching grant. So please consider going to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And uh, thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time. The Catholic Culture Podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.